هذا هو اليوم الذي صنعه الرب فلنفرح ولنتهلل به المسيح قام من بين الأموات ووطئ الموت بالموت ووهب الحياة للذين في القبور المسيح قام من بين الأموات ووطئ الموت بالموت ووهب الحياة للذين في القبور Christos anesti epne kron thanaton, thanaton batisas, keti sentith ni masi zoif karis amenos. Hello everybody, welcome back to the uh, next segment of uh, Big Bang Thrills BTS vlog. Yeah, uh, I'm on the couch here, I'm doing some work. Uh, let me give you a time and date stamp. It is 23 hours and... 46 minutes into the day of Saturday, May 14th, 2016. That's right, yeah. Um, so let me say, Messiah Kham, uh, Christos Anesti, and uh, Christ is risen. That's typically the greeting uh, that you give a person uh, in the Eastern Orthodox tradition, in Eastern Christian tradition, uh, around this time, till about, oh, till about basically June, uh, the first week of June. That's when it kind of ends. Um, so, uh, let's, we're, 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 see, I, 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 I think of things, and then all of a sudden it leaves my mind, and it, 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 now it's coming back into my mind again. Uh, I go over and I watch and review my videos. I watch the, I watch uh, uh, the content, and, and I realize sometimes, and this is what happens sometimes, well, enough, that I go off on tangents and don't fully finish the concept or the thought that I initially started with. So, in other words, the place you start with and the place you end up is not necessarily uh, going to be the sort of the same thing. And so, it leaves it open and loose. And the one other thing that I did want to bring across, but never did, in talking about the Jewish conspiracy theory... And there's a lot of it out there. This, I mean, it's not, it's not, there's no shortage of, 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 the, of this so-called Jewish conspiracy theory. But the thing is, is that, no, you know, uh, no Jew should actually feel bad about this because there are also conspiracy theories about aliens, uh, hollow earth, um, flat earth. There's, believe it or not, there, there's a whole conspiracy theory on flat earth now. Uh, I don't know if it's now, but it's there. You can sort of go look, you can see it when it's there. Um, there's the, uh, Conspiracy on the fake moon landing. <laughs> you know, if you if you want to, if you want to look for a conspiracy theory about almost anything, you, you, there, you, chances are you're going to find it. So it's not that it's one group or another. It's you know there was one specific group, and oh, I feel bad because excuse me, there's a conspiracy theory about my group. Uh, well. You're in a company with a whole bunch of other different people, so uh, I don't know. These are things that I'm not concerned with. I don't care if someone has conspiracy theories about me or my group or whatever. Uh, but when you sit down and look at conspiracy theories themselves, the one uh, over and I'm looking at a, a lot of them, one overarching uh, or commonality between all these uh, conspiracy theories are is that the conspiracy is. Oh, monolithic that everybody's on the same page and it's massive. Well, the problem is, is that you've got all these different theories out there, and some of these theories are actually competing with each other. They're 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 competing theories. They don't they're not compatible. They're, they're in many ways contradictory. So if you have contradictory uh, conspiracy theories out there, how can these conspiracies be be true if there's there's contradictions in them? And the thing is, it's not that they're not conspiracies out there. It's just they're not vast conspiracies. They're not not everybody's on the same page, and some think people will do their own little things in there. And you know, the, it's not a coherent action by a so-called monolithic group. There are a lot of little subgroups, and this sort of and this is how the Jews kind of they don't. There's not that they're. It's not that Jews go up and say, I'm going to be part of a conspiracy. They kind of stumble into it. And the Jews get it more often than not because uh, throughout history, 
and you can sort of look at this and go back and look at the uh, the European Enlightenment. And the, and the European Enlightenment came in in multiple stages. You had the Italian Renaissance, and then after the Italian Renaissance, you had the Spanish Renaissance, and the last Renaissance was basically the uh, uh, French Renaissance. Uh, and so you have those ma the major the major Renaissance there. Uh, the Italian Renaissance was when the Greeks started coming over into Italy. Uh, it was through the Greeks that you ended up having a lot of the Renaissance in the uh, sort of eastern part of uh, Europe. That's where the Italian Renaissance came in. Uh, in, the Sp in Spain, you had... Uh, the Spain didn't go through the Dark Ages the way the rest of Europe did. Uh, and that's primarily because you had uh, the Arabs in the um, in the uh, in Spain who brought a lot of their knowledge up from uh, the Middle East, and the Middle East hadn't gone into its Dark Ages yet. Uh, as the as Europe came out of the Dark Ages, the Middle East was and the Eastern world was going into the Dark Ages. Uh, this is, was due to the uh, the uh, Muslim invasion. They were destroying libraries and doing what we don't normally saw today, as we see today. In, in, in our, we talk about the, the Muslim issue today. We talk about Islam, and we see how the Taliban uh, was destroying, uh, you know, blowing up uh, uh, statues of Buddha in Afghanistan. They were anything that was not within their definition of what is so-called holy uh, were blown up and destroyed. And then we see this in Syria. We see this in Iraq. Uh, they have... The, these basically people... Uh, the Islamists are fundamentally the destroyers of history. They, these are the people who wipe out history. They burn libraries. They burn uh, architecture. They burn uh, archaeological ruins. They'll destroy things so that the history does not come forward. And uh, this is what was happening in the Middle East. And so what happened, as that was happening in the Middle East, uh, a lot of the uh, knowledge started coming into into Europe. And this is what produced the Renaissance, was Eastern knowledge. And this is what, if I go back to conspiracy theory again, this is what formed the, uh, the, the, the various different uh, Illuminati societies, the various different secret societies. What were they bringing up? What was the treasure? It wasn't gold and silver. It was these libraries that were coming up. Uh, and what happens is, well, some of the, uh, the Europeans, uh, particularly in the East, could read Greek. Uh, most of the Europeans couldn't. As a matter of fact, most of the Europeans at that time were illiterate. The people, the group people who, in Europe who could read, write, and did and did mathematics were Jews. These were, and so they formed societies and were in positions of actual power because they're the ones who could do the accounting, they're the ones who could do banking, they're the ones who could read and write. And this has to do with the, with the, 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 uh, the, the whole principle uh, that the Jews have of yeshiva, the schools. And it's around the yeshivas that you have the sort of uh, the protection of uh, sort of called Jewish enlightenment. The, their knowledge and the, the, the ability that they could read and write and had an understanding of history. This was all due to the yeshiva, and this is what gave the uh, Jew a sort of advantage over the average European, is that the Jews always had this as standard, and it, it followed them wherever they went. Uh, so it was more likely than not, if you were a Jew, you could get into very good positions in society, and in, in any government you wanted to get into, because you were the one who could read and write. You were the one who could do the mathematics. You are the one who could do the accounting for, uh, for uh, uh, finance and banking. And so this is, it, 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 this is what put them into positions. And so let's say that the Jews, and they do, have the average amount of people who don't do nice things, right? They're not so good people. Well, the thing is, if you're that group, is now becomes the average for people in power or people in government positions. The because they are the higher percentage of people in those in those higher positions, the positions of authority, the negative aspects of being a Jew, the sort of the negative aspects of, of any society, is going to be amplified because that small group is now focused in, in where the power is. And because there's more of them there, the tendency to, ha to have corruption go throughout the ranks uh, ends up being and looking like a Jewish conspiracy, even though it's not specifically a Jewish conspiracy. It's simply the fact that uh, the Jews 
uh, have the ability, to, through their yeshivas uh, and their private school system, that they're always more intelligent, they're always um, the ones who could read and write. Where if you couldn't read and write, then you were at the mercy of other people. And so this is sort of what gave the Jews, in many cases, their, their freedom and independence in, in, sort of in, the, in, in the initial stages. But as people started to look around because things went wrong in society, uh, governments became corrupt, they would want to turn around and see who's in, who's in the government. Well, they're all Jews up there because yeah, they, they, earn their, they earn their way in. These are the ones who could do the job. Uh, so you can't fault them for that. But because they are the main focus now, and these are the, this is the main group in there, you go, oh, the problem for society is the Jews. And you go back in history and look at the and see the number of Jews involved in these particular issues through uh, the uh, sort of called the negative events in his history, in man's history. And you see the Jews there, uh, you know, are in there one event after another. And you say, oh, yeah, that, that must be a Jewish thing. And it's not, they're not sort of looking at the fact that the Jews were the more, more educated at the time. They were the ones who could read and write where the average European couldn't. And so you can see this through the European Enlightenment, on all the aspects of the European Enlightenment, that the Jews were primarily the ones who were in there. They were the ones in the banking system, they were in the finance system, uh, they were the ones and making the laws, because again, these were the people who could read and write. I mean, if you couldn't read and write, how are you going to make a law? And so you can see that What's happened is that the tendency is that when something goes wrong, you blame the people in power, but who are the people in power? If you happen to be, <laughs> you know, the Jews who were in power, and because they're, uh, again, their negative aspects are no more than any other ethnic group. But because they're so much focused within the power system, everyone's sort of looking at them, the negative aspects seem to be amplified. It looks like it's amplified. But it's not really. So... Uh, this is sort of saying is that there is no real fundamental Jewish conspiracy. It's simply an appearance uh, because the way the Jews are the ones who do read and write better, they're the ones who are typically more literate. They're typically the ones who could do math and the, and the financing. Uh, they are in business. Uh, they have this sort of ability on average as compared to the Europeans. The Europeans were not never were never really sort of, you know, <coughs> in there, but then, you know, if, they, they, if these people couldn't even write and this was standard, this is what you would see. Uh, anyways, uh, I'm going to leave this here for now, and I will uh, talk about more of this in some of the other videos that I'm working on, and I'll see you uh, probably sometime later on tonight, because I will come back for another uh, uh, bit of work. Uh, uh, I'll probably go to bed in about a half hour get up in about three hours. All right, I'll talk to you then. All right. Well, hello, everybody. He's also nasty. Monsieur Khan. And Christ is risen. Yep, this is going to be the first and last uh, vlog for today. Uh, <laughs> give you a time and date stand to give you a sort of a reference of where we are. It is one hour and seven minutes into the day of uh, Monday, May sixteenth, uh, two thousand sixteen. Yeah. Uh, it is uh, yeah one o'clock in the morning. Doing the late nights again. Uh. It's going to be the first, as I said, it's the first and the last, so we're near the end of the day. I have got about an hour left of work, or the work left to do. Uh, I had gotten up around noon. I was planning, in, uh, the last time I talked to you, I was planning to get up uh, at uh, 7 a.m. and go to church, but uh, my ride called and, and uh, ended up not having a ride to church, so... I ended up staying home. And then I went to my parents' place around uh, 1.30, 2 o'clock. Uh, got back uh, 6.37. And then sort of just went through some of the odds and ends that I have to do. Uh, working on my notebook, uh, fixing up my notebook. I still have uh, 
a little bit more work to do before the notebook is finally fixed, is finally done. For now, anyways. Uh, it may seem like I've been working on the notebook for a while, because it, and it has been some time, but the thing is, is that you, you, you work on it, you organize it, and you look at it now, and you think about what you've done, and how the different ideas interconnect, and then you realize, hey, maybe there's a, a better way to so go try the second way, and then the third way, fourth way. So finally, I'm trying this way to sort of see how this uh, sort of structure works in terms of the way I'm, I'm organizing the notebook now. I'm having some milk tea. And sort of going through things and sort of having sort of... I mean, I have, I have good discussions with my dad, and my dad is a theologian and uh, uh, knows his history quite well. He's uh, uh, been to Harvard, he's been to uh, uh, the University of Salonika, uh, Thessaloniki, that's in Greece. Uh, that's the uh, Aristotle school. Uh, so, <laughs> he's got quite the background. Um, we've had a good discussion today, and it is about the, uh, about, about the Jews and the origins of Hebrew. Now, the problem that sort of exists, and this is sort of what I noticed, is that we have a view of what Hebrew is today. But if you study any language, and go back and study these, uh, the history of languages, you can fall back on an, an archaeological track and see how the language changes. Where, where, you know, from one period to another, you'll see the different changes in them. What happens is, is that the Hebrew archaeological record disappears between, uh, well, I would say between 300 and 500 AD. Your, your, your Hebrew record starts to disappear. And it does not show up in archaeology the way the, the Greek, uh, the, uh, the Syriac, and the Aramaic show up. Uh, so, we look at you and wonder, well, is there, is there an issue here? Is there an issue with uh, what we conceive today as Hebrew? Is that Hebrew that we, conceive, that we see today actually this ancient language? And the answer is no. Is that you've had a lot of different groups uh, within the uh, Judaic history, within uh, Jewish history, and all you have to do is go into rabbinical studies to understand that there is not one monolithic Jewish group, that there are a variety of different Jewish groups. And this is what would be the problem if, if uh, Benjamin Netanyahu sort of said, Israel is going to be a Jewish state. The question becomes, well, what do you define as a Jew? So I can guarantee you that there's going to be some groups who will disagree with, and some uh, uh, Jewish groups who will disagree with his definition. It is a very contentious thing to provide a monolithic or overarching definition of what a Jew is. And some of the art lectures that I have, the rabbinical lectures that I have, which are pretty good, they're pretty interesting. Uh, depending, you know, if you're a person who likes history, you like sort of going through uh, 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 these historical mysteries, like that's what they are. They're, they're, you're you're trying you you're chasing down clues throughout history, and so you have to sit through these le lectures, and it's like meeting an individual. You sit down, you talk to them, you find out who they are, you look into their background, uh, and this gives you a sense as to uh, the, what inf the information you receive. But if you're getting information about these people, and you're, you're told, well, this guy is this, and he's this, that, and, and you know, you hear a lot of call second-hand opinions of the person. Well, what do you? What is your first hand? When you sit down and talk, what is your first opinion? That's what is your opinion as you meet the person. And of course, there's your initial opinion when you first meet the person. And then as you go back over things and you look further into the background, you've, you produce further lectures, you get a better sense of who the person is or who the group is that you're, you're looking at or studying. And you get a better understanding for the environment. And there are lectures out there by various different rabbinical groups 
on forgeries done by various different Jewish scholars. And these are One group will argue and, and, and accuse another group of, of forging and tampering with the historical documents. Well, that same group will turn around and that, that they, they're accusing will turn around and accuse the original group that that that, that that's initially threw out the accusation of uh, forging letters themselves. So, in other words, there's a lot sort of uh, 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 a a not a contradiction, but a sort of a contentious environment where not everybody's on the same page about things. And this is what I was talking about, you know, you're going into Jewish history, and oh, I'll talk about Jewish, uh, going into Jewish history and, and ask you a question about whether or not you have a Jewish, uh, a monolithic Jewish conspiracy. And when you see that the groups are not on the same page, when there's a lot of various different Jewish groups, and this has been this way his historically, then the argument of a single monolithic Jewish conspiracy kind of falls apart. So the question is, is that, this is where the discussion lives, is that why, is, why are the Jews so often history pointed at as being the primary problem? And that's what I discussed earlier, is because uh, the Jews, to their credit, have had the yeshiva system, the school system, for a very long time, and, and as in the yeshiva system, particularly for boys, it was considered to be standard. It was standard for the Jewish people, for the Jewish population, to be educated. They understood how important education was as a standard for everybody. And this is why Jews are in the positions they are today. This is why they have what they have. And this is why they are they, they were where they were uh, historically. I mean, they were always in the positions of writing. They were always in the positions of accounting, and banking and finance, historical record keeping. This is one of the reasons why uh, you look at these, some of these uh, Roman historians and you go back and look at them, you begin to realize with a name like Josephus, the guy was a Jewish. So what, what, what do you have? Why do you have... Uh, uh, you know, a Jewish person uh, acting as a Roman historian. And well, it's because these are the people who could read and write. And, and so what happens when you see, uh, and, and this is where we can go back to Neil deGuise Tyson's uh, uh, lecture on the ignorance of the religion, talking about how uh, the sort of black shadow rolled over the Middle East around 800 AD. Well, what is he describing? He's describing the emergence of Islam. And as Islam, which was, were, were the barbarians who basically sat on top of the Byzantine and the ancient history back there in the Middle East, uh, they pushed a lot of the books, the intelligence, out of the Middle East and into Europe. And that is where you have the two roots, basically Italy and Spain. This is the beginning of the, uh, the European Renaissance. And, and there, there are a number of Renaissance. There's the Italian is first, the, Spain, uh, the Spanish Enlightenment comes next, and then the third and the final one is essentially the, uh, the French Enlightenment. The English actually have a very bizarre position in this, because they have, the English have a bizarre position in history to begin with, because, uh, well, uh, while... Europe was definitely barbarian. England was a barbarian to a certain degree, but England was known to both the the uh, to the Romans, to the Greeks, and to the Egyptians. And so, it, it, England was not like the rest of Europe, where it was completely untouched. It it had interactions between Europe, uh, between Egypt, between uh, the Greeks, and, and, and between the Romans. There was a trade route that went back and forth with, that included uh, that area there, uh, the area of England. So it falls in this very peculiar, peculiar position that it sits outside, in many ways, of the European sphere in terms of world history. And more properly sits within the ancient history, with the, with the history of antiquities. You know, the, the Arab 
invasions, the Arab emergence in 800 AD in the Middle East, blackens and blots out a large chunk of what we understand about him, about the antiquities. Antiquities is prior is now the prior to 800 AD. Uh, after eight, between well between 800 AD and 1400 AD, you have the progressive uh, darkening of the Middle East. You have the, the Middle East going into the Dark Ages, and Europe coming out of the Dark Ages. And this is due to the flood here the, in the Spanish. Uh, world, this is where we get the Jews translating the Arabic, this is where alchemy comes from, and I think what needs to understand is alchemy is pre-Islam. So you don't have the understanding of alchemy in um, Islam as being developed in, as part of Islamic culture, but rather you have it something that, that, that and this is what happens with a lot of barbarian when with barbarian, barbarian conquests, the barbarian conquers a civilization, and then absorbs the civilization as their own. It adopts and ad and it adopts and adapts it to become their culture. In other words, so the Romans' history and culture was not Roman; it was Greek and Hellenic. The Romans came in as barbarians, took it over, and, and it became Roman history and culture. Uh, the Mongols went into China, into China, into Asia, and took over the Chinese civilizations, and and, and adopted and adapted them. And so this is how you have Mong, uh, Mong Mongolia and the Mongolians, uh, Khan, Genghis Khan, uh, Obadiah Khan, all becoming and, and and eventually absorbing the cultures. Of uh, Asia, the Asia of China, uh, of China, and sort of blossoming on their own, but not specifically dis uh, uh, disconnected from the ancient. Um, the Arab culture is the exact same way; it sits on top of the culture of antiquities, which is basically an Asian culture. And so you have these interesting histories, and you see how that the Jews throughout this whole history, because they're there throughout the whole history, uh, pass through as the fundamentally educated ones. They're the ones who could read and write all the way throughout. And so what happens, it, it, it's, it's not a uh, sort of understanding this history is not so much of an anomaly to see that you have Jews in very high position because this is who they were as a people. This they were always. They're the ones who were depended on for these particular type of jobs and these particular uh, uh, professions because the, they were the only ones who could do it. So uh, this is where you know history and 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 the research is is extremely important to really understand a subject. And it's not that it's a complete understanding. There's a lot more to be understood. Uh, definitely, there's a lot more to be researched, but. Uh, going through it in this manner, you can begin to understand that uh, there isn't a monolithic uh, Jewish conspiracy theory. That this is, happens to be uh, people who are in the right place at the right time, and because the numbers the, there there are the numbers of Jews in these particular areas, because of uh, the the sort of uh, historical background of the Jews, this sort of makes. Uh, gives you a, a reason it's okay, this is why there's so many because typically on odd this is where they're gonna be anyways uh, I'm gonna leave this here for now uh, hopefully I'll get to editing it and uploading it tomorrow uh, I'm not too sure if that's gonna happen but we'll see <laughs> all right I'll see you in the next segment of uh, Big Bang Theory's BTS vlogs all right take it easy I should say Big Bang Theory RL's BTS vlog Welcome to the library.
Democratic Earth. Earth.